Well, hello, welcome everyone. I'm Alexis Badenmayer, and today I am joined live by Eric Fuchs and Dr. Leanne Fuchs. Uh, hi, Eric and Leanne, thank you for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having us, Alexis. Hello. Well, it's so great to have you with us. Um, I was inspired to interview you both because we were introduced through Understanding Ag. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a really cool conversation with Ray Archuleta and Sarah Kyo. And Ray, of course, is a soil scientist. He's one of the people in Kiss the Ground. And Sarah Kyo is a nutritionist. And I happened to find them at the same place. They were at Ray's farm. and. And I said, well, it would be awesome if I could interview you both because you have this, you know, complementary knowledge about soil health and human health and how these things fit together. And then when I reached out to Understanding Ag to see if there were more people that I could interview, I found that there's another pair. So we have Eric Fuchs, who does water quality and soil health, and Dr. Leanne Fuchs is a chiropractor and a nutritionist. So. Let me have you both tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and your expertise before we get started. Please, <laughs> So um, I'm a chiropractor. I've been in practice, uh, private practice for 22 years. Um, I have two bachelors of science degrees, one in physical education and one in human biology. Um, and then I graduated from Logan College of Chiropractic back in um, August of 1999. Um, I also have a massage therapy degree. So I've been a massage therapist for <laughs> longer than I can say or want to say but about 26 years um, and knew that I always wanted to be more proactive with with healthcare versus reactive I wanted to be on the front end uh, versus the tail end when people are already really really sick with chronic illnesses and it's so much more difficult to get back to battery so to speak so I was in private practice for about 16 years um, and my patients were doing really really well but they weren't doing as well as what I wanted them to be. They weren't holding their adjustments. And back in 1895, I don't know if you know anything about D.D. Palmer or the, the first chiropractor, um, but his first chiropractic adjustment was to a deaf man who had gone deaf uh, about 16 years prior. He was working under a desk. Something happened and he could no longer hear. Um, and D.D. Palmer um, basically was palpating the gentleman's spine and said, do you mind if, however, he communicated to the deaf man, mind if I uh, adjust this? And the guy was like, thumbs up and adjusted him and the man heard. That was the first chiropractic adjustment. And so I wanted to know why the adjustments and why the patients that I was seeing weren't responding that fantastically within one or two adjustments. So I started undercutting and my path led me to uh, nutrition response testing. And I got an advanced degree in nutrition response testing. And that uh, basically is a system and a technology that allows me to evaluate a system's body in real time, the functionality of it, to find if there's any deficiencies or any um, issues going on with it, find out what the issues are, and then also find out what the remedies um, for those ailments are as well. So I've been doing that uh, now for about uh, six years in addition to my uh, chiropractic practice and also have another associate in office as well. So yeah. Wow. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking this hour with us, Dr. Fuchs, because I know you're super busy. I understand your schedule. You're in the office with your, your patients from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Thursday, and you take Friday off. So thank you so much for, for doing this. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise. And how about you, Eric, You your your water expertise. You now, tell us what your job is, where you work, and how you ended up there. Okay, so I, uh, I work with Missouri Rural Water Association as a source water technician. So I was raised on a farm all my life, uh, was always kind of, uh, as I took the weird farmer, we've had a grazing system for a long time, just we were conventional, but yet non-conventional and, and uh, uh, always had that different aspect on what we did on a farm. But then about seven years ago, I started working as a source water technician. And as I started around the state and worked with little communities, and what I do is we try to help communities keep their drinking water clean before it becomes drinking water. So what I started noticing is that, you know, within about three or four months of the job, I'm like, wow, you know, all the problems are coming from agriculture for the most part. And, and not not people out to destroy water water quality, but just not understanding the tie-in between drinking water and agriculture. And so uh, about two years into the job, I was fortunate enough to uh, kind of weasel my way into NRCS soil health training. 
where I met Ray Archuleta, I met Doug Peterson, uh, I was at Dave Brandt's farm. And uh, so really started going down the road because I had a soils degree from the University of Missouri. And just like, re I had to relearn everything that I had learned conventionally. So it really just, the, the, the light came on and said, you know, there's solutions out here that are very simple solutions, solutions we can implement now. And so it just kind of took me down a different path. And, and then because of that path, Gabe Brown kissed the ground, you know, it just really brought me into similar like-minded people. Uh, about four years ago, Leanne, Leanne and I got together and, and I started going to some of her conferences. And it was really interesting because they would be talking about soil health at nutrition conferences. And you come to soil health conferences, they're talking about nutrition. You know, so we got her in soil health training with that Ray's farm. And uh, it really just kind of, the light bulb came on with us, how our jobs and what we do and our purpose just kind of interacts. And so we've just been on this learning I, I, I'm learning more and more and more every day, but it's really a good connection on trying to solve these problems, not only in Missouri, but around the Corn Belt and around the country for water quality, because I think we've got some serious problems that we need to try to tackle. Very cool. So, Dr. Fuchs, I was really interested by that story that you told about the first adjustment and how miraculously it worked and how you were concerned that your patients weren't getting the full benefits of chiropractory for other reasons, perhaps not having perfect nutrition. I, I've been reading up or listening to Eric's presentations and he gives a similar example. Eric, you talk about New York City's water system and how that's kind of an example of how, how it can really work. Um, you, I happen to have gone to law school in New York City and I learned about this in law school, about how New York City set it up so that they would have really good water and they don't have to do a lot of water treatment. Eric, tell us how that works in this ideal system. Well, so in, in New York City situation, they bought their entire watershed. And so in, in a lot of places like little towns that work around Missouri, while the lake may be owned by the city or, or the entity, the, the, the land surrounding it where the runoff comes may be, you know, ag, ag land or owned by other agencies. Well, New York bought, bought their entire watershed, so they control every aspect of what happens in that, and so they're able to manage it to keep it pristine. Because from a both a monetary standpoint, you know, if you don't have to do anything to the water, you keep it clean, it's clean to begin with. Lake Tahoe is another great example of that. So everything around tourism in Lake Tahoe is, is about the clearness of that lake. So, I mean, they have pretty stringent regulations on making sure everything's done, but at the same time, the drinking water comes straight out of the lake. I don't, I think they may even add, add a little chlorine, but not a lot, and, and it goes right into the system. So it's just examples, and I'm not, a, you know, we've talked a little bit before, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but there are, it, it's, it, it can be a win-win on things. You don't have to, to give one to not have another, you know, but situations like that of, of, of tight management of a, of a source water protection area makes it to where people do have more clean, you know, more better quantity and quality in regards to drinking water. So if it's not water treatment that's cleaning the water, what's cleaning the water? Well, there it's without getting into great details, you know, there's, there's certain chemicals that are added. So you have different things in water like dirt, you know, for instance, or sediments and soils and chemicals. You have to add what's called polymers many times to the water that, that then forms little particles or what's called flocks to where that stuff settles out. And what's then you know, go through a filtration system like, like uh, sand filters. It may be different levels of sand, anthracite, different uh, where you get some absorption type thing, take out more. And lots of time carbon is added, just like your Brita filter at home. Carbon takes out uh, taste and odor. Sometimes it takes out some volatile chemicals, like if we have, um, have you know, uh, farm chemicals and stuff that pulls it out. Chlorine is usually added someplace in there for a disinfectant, you know, because. Chlorine, I always say, is kind of a necessary evil. We do have the uh, luxury of having water delivered to our homes in pipes. And so uh, I think there's certain things we need, but it's just the process. Now, that is usually with surface water. When you have groundwater, much of the time groundwater, because of the natural filtration of the earth itself, you can pull water right out of the ground, like where I live, uh, add a little chlorine. Some systems don't add chlorine. comes right out of the well, right into the home. So depending on where the water comes from, usually if it's from a surface type source where you have more 
nature involved with it, more runoff, more things, it's going to be a different treatment process. But it's always cheaper, as I say, to keep it clean to begin with than have to use all the technology to keep it clean afterwards. You know, I can get into nitrates and stuff like that, but uh, but it is quite quite the technology to, we, we're very fortunate in the U.S. that we have, you know, water does not kill us immediately like it does in some countries with cholera and things like that. We are fortunate in the United States with our, with our drinking water. But if we have an ideal system, it's actually the soil that's filtering the water, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you don't have to do a lot of treatment. Yeah, it's not only soil, but as I say, you know, even from ag grounds, it's about what happens on those grounds stays on that ground. You know, and, and, and water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments are probably our biggest things that we have to deal with. And uh, there's no reason that should be leaving the farm ground if it stays where it's at. And like you said, soils, water's infiltrating through the soil, not running off immediately. We don't have near the problems. I mean, are there going to have to be some treatment processes? Yes. But for the most part, uh, as I always say, farmers can, I don't care what they do on their ground, just as long as it stays there. As soon as it leaves there, it becomes my, becomes my problem is drinking water, you know, but as we talked before a little on the phone with the soil health practices, with, with the things that understanding ag is coming out with to it, it's, it's, it's not an either or. We can have both. We can have high yields. We can have clean water and not all the problems we have now. We have a lot of algae blooms, the dead zone in the Gulf. The dead zone is just the great big area that we're, we're concentrated in one place, but we have those areas all over the corn belt in little watersheds or big watersheds in the very same way. Well, I want to get to the problems, but first I was inspired by Leanne's story that she told at the beginning of our talk to, to talk about how things work in an ideal situation. So what's the correlation Leanne, in our own bodies to this concept of healthy soil being able to filter and clean uh, the system. Is it is that kind of how it works with a, a healthy immune system and a yeah. good gut health? Uh, absolutely. So you see the uh, microbiome of the soil is almost identical to the microbiome of, of, our, of our gut, right? And so if we see uh, the soils being destroyed or having issues with chemicals, um, or other uh, elements that are being added to the to the soils, and then a person consumes that, whether it be um, in the foods that they're eating or the water that they're drinking, or even if it's airborne, um, then it comes into our, our system and it can have deleterious effects up, upon our gut. It can kill the good bacteria, the good flora, and then we have an imbalance. It can cause leaky gut syndrome. It can cause leaky brain syndrome and a myriad of other types of issues, hypothyroid issues, cancers, and the like. And so if we can start with healthy soils um, and that healthy practice of regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, and like what my husband said, keeping um, what, you, what you're what you doing on your land so that it's not going anywhere else. Um, and, and going a step before that, just keeping everything organic and healthy, <laughs> that would be even better. Um, then people won't be sick in the first place. So it's direct, it's a direct correlation, one one to one, with with health of soil, health of um, us as people. Yeah. I, I always have that. That's one of my interruption <laughs> times. I always have to say, if farmers were doing their job properly, we would put her out of business. And I and joke with that, but it, it, there's a lot of truth <laughs> to that. If we would grow healthy food on healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, there wouldn't be such a need for the things, the interventions that she has to do. Yeah, because to add to that, um, when when patients come into my practice, I'm doing the nutritional uh, care with them and I've found out um, what's going on and how I wanna handle them. I use what I call uh, the basic building blocks, um, genuine replacement parts for the body. And most of those things that I'm using are, are um, organic substances or homeopathic substances or herbal substances. And they're all organic and we change life at a cellular level. So whereas medication, if a person is taking a medication, it's um, enforcing a change, right? And all medications have side effects. Um, what we do is we come in at a cellular level, feed the body, and the body actually regrows and heals. And so that's why sometimes there's a bit of a time lag or, a, a, you know, people are like, well, I take this medicine, I, my blood pressure goes down within 30 minutes, but there's also side effects that might be affecting the kidneys or other organs within the body itself. But when I get the nutritional substances, it actually regrows the body, it feeds the deficiencies 
Um, it, it handles the, the, the body is so uh, innately intelligent. It knows what it needs and wants and, and you feed it and it regrows at that level and then can function uh, and get back to battery. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> it's beautiful how these things work so well um, when everything is how it should be. So now let's get into the problems because really, Eric, I know that's what you have to deal with as a water quality specialist. You are, you're a surface water specialist, right? What is your title again? Source, source water, source source water, water protector. protector. <laughs> okay, so it's all the same. That's close enough. <laughs> so you're dealing with runoff essentially from agricultural lands primarily. And I've been reading your blog, and that's how I found about you too, because you you all have a blog at Farm Progress. And and it might be surprising to folks what I learned in your blog that quote, there are few to no regulations on what can be spread, sprayed, and used on row cropping or pasture areas, specifically fertilizers or chemicals. There are also no regulations on the amount of soil or runoff from these areas. So so what's going on here, Eric? Well, it's, boy, that's that's a that's a broad question. That, you know, it's, in, in my world, there's a lot of regulations both on wastewater, because we deal in, the, our Missouri Rural Water deals in wastewater too. So a lot of the, there's, there's, uh, point source and non-point source pollution. And point source is just that. I can look at it, point to it, and say there's where it is. So from a regulatory standpoint, there's a lot of regulation put on drinking water, as there should be. We want to make sure there's clean drinking water. And there's a lot of regulation put on wastewater, what comes out of these cities and towns for wastewater. And for the most part, they do a pretty good job. But like I said, there's no, really no regulations on the non-point side, which is for the most part agriculture. And Again, I always like to come back. It's not these farmers that are sitting down driving a tractor saying, boy, I'm just going to see how much water I can pollute the next day. They really, there's a lot of non-understanding, which again, you know, soil health practices, understanding ag, they, they, they don't even know. And I was trained in soils. I was trained in agronomics and there was a lot I didn't. So, but the fact is that there's a lot of problems with when, when the fertilizer is applied, how much is applied. The fact is we're applying it on soils that are worn out, that can't handle it. Same thing with herbicides, you know, you, you're getting resistance in glyphosate. You, there's just a lot of problems in the fact of, but the main, the main thing is the soil is not capable of handling what we do with it. And, and you know, you're seeing more and more the soils are worn out more, so it takes more fertilizers, or you're getting, or you're getting resistance. So, again, I'm not a person of regulation. I'm a person for us to change it from within, but a, a huge part of it is just an education process and a, 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 the ability to come up and say, hey, we've got a problem here, and how do we change it? And Leanne, how does how is this impacting your patients? Do you get many patients who are having issues because of contaminants in our food, in our water, uh, maybe environmental pollution? Oh, absolutely, a, a lot of them. Um, so I'm in, uh, we're in the the uh, Midwest, and so every spring and fall we we have the planting and then the harvesting. And um, I used to every spring and fall get people that were sick. And we just thought they had colds and flus. You know, it's just the summer bug or, or the spring bug. It's a fall bug. You know, we haven't killed all the, the, the bad guys out. And, and so people are getting sick. And, and when I started testing my patients, nine times out of 10, it was pesticide poisonings. Nine times out of 10 that I was finding or, or other chemical toxins um, or other heavy metal pollutants within the bodies themselves that were making these people sick. And it was startling to me because I had always thought, oh, it's just allergies or it's you know a bacteria or a virus and and it ended up not being that at all so yes i am seeing many people sick i have autistic children that we care for ashburger children that we care for people that have had cancers you know we're seeing a, a higher level of glioblastomas in our area and, and and asking questions as to why we're seeing these elevated levels of, of these types of cancers and such so yes to answer your question, yes, we are. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. It's very disturbing. So Eric, there are things that we can do about this. I want to quote your blog again. 
Uh, you say farmers and ranchers are responsible for every drop of water that lands on or runs off their land. More than likely, this will wind up as someone's drinking water at some point. It's our job as producers to make sure it's kept clean. But you just mentioned that you you would prefer that it wasn't the government telling people, you know, how to do it. You think farmers really can develop the skills to to take this on and be responsible stewards. I, I do. You know, there, there, there's a bigger picture here with, you know, and we can get in the ag, you know, government programs and, and, and subsidies and stuff like that. So why the system is skewed to go a certain way. But the technology is there. And, the, you, you know, cover crop, soil health, no-till, it is not tough technology. It is new tech. It's not new technology. It's new technology to them. But, the, you know, you know, to, to outlaw chemicals, to outlaw fertilizers, you know, usually regulation, while it may come about from a good reason, usually doesn't go down the, the road it needs to go. So it's an education process. I mean, we're, we're doing producer meetings all the time. We're talking about when they need to apply or soil health. They just don't know. They've not been taught. You know, and I, I joke, my dad was, was born in 1935. Uh, he died a couple of years ago. He really was never part of not knowing that there was anything but fertilizer. So we've got a whole generation that really, when I say have no agronomic skills, they have no agronomic skills like our grandparents and our great grandparents had, you know, so the technology is there. It's not expensive. And in the long run with good soil health practices, they will automatically use less chemicals. They will automatically use less fertilizers. You know, for, so for me to come out and say, we need to stop it all. And it's, it's not, it's crazy. You know, it's too big of a jump for most people, but if we use these soil health principles, I always, I hate to say there's, it's a silver bullet, but it's better food, it's better, it's healthy food, it's better water. It does really truly fix things and it's simple practices, it's management. You know, with, with the advent of GMOs and glyphosate, we lost the ability to truly manage our soils and because we planted and we sprayed and we went home. And we lost that ability to understand as Gabe Brown's book, you know, from dirt to soil, there is a big difference. And, and, and once that light comes on with people, once you see them understand that, it's like, oh my gosh, we're farmers again. And, and it's the same way with, with livestock, you know, with rotating livestock, grazing systems, and the well, Lord knows it, it's more work. We have trouble getting it done sometimes, but you know, it's, it is, it's just, there's simple ways to create a huge lasting solutions that just helps everybody across the board. Well, Dr. Fuchs, I'm sure you see this in your practice as well. I, I understand that a lot of your patients are dealing with environmental contamination that they might not have control over, but part of getting healthy is learning to eat right. And we've, we've lost some of these skills as well, just like Eric was talking about how we've got this formula from the chemical companies. You've got your GMO seeds and your pesticides and your synthetic fertilizers. In the same way, eaters, we've gotten really used to just buying a lot of prepared foods. We don't know how to cook from scratch. We're not exactly sure what's healthy or what's not. We've been told over my lifetime, low fat, but now people say we want high fat. Um, so how do you help your, your patients navigate this? Oh, um, I try and keep it very simple. And I always try and do it on a gradient scale, right? So if a person comes into me and let's say they have a soda pop, um, not addiction, but the, they like they love their soda pop. So I'll just get in communication with them and ask them. I'm like, so let's say they're having eight to ten soda pops a day. I might be like, well, could we have nine a day? Um, because you really truly uh, sugar is an addictive substance. It's a, it causes a physiological addiction, just like cocaine or alcohol. So you can't actually remove somebody from a diet that they're uh, have been consuming that's highly processed with highly refined sugars. Um, immediately or else you're going to cause them a lot of suffering, which is unnecessary. Um, so everything in life should be accomplished through gradient scale approach, right? And so I give my patient on a weekly basis, we work on wins. Like if they come there, like I did nine soda pops a day this week, I'll be like, that's awesome. So let's try eight, you know, and then um, we steadily go through that. Now I'm like, how about a vegetable? Are you eating any vegetables? Because um, sadly, um, some people eat no vegetables. Uh, they were, just weren't raised on that. They actually actually don't know about that. They eat and shop on the inner aisles of the store. 
Whereas on the outer aisles of the stores where everything is living and, 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 and uh, fresh vegetables and fruits and things of that nature. So it's always better. So I tell my patient shop around the outside of the store. Don't shop on the inside of the store. So you get your fruits and your vegetables. And, and I also try and tell them if they can, uh, organic and also non-GMO. Um, and just by doing those two simple practices, yes, sometimes they're like, well, it costs a little bit more. And I'm like, truly it does. But in the long run, it'll save you quality and quantity of life. And that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve is uh, the betterment of their life and, and their and honestly their children's lives. Because there is a um, there was a, a study called the Pottinger cat study and Dr. Pottinger uh, studied cats um, and their adrenals. And what he found was that our um, diets uh, were so deplete in any nutrition that um, each generation got sicker and sicker and their vitality got less and less. So let's say that our, my great grandmother was eating the same diet as I was, but because the, the soils are deplete and there's more chemicals and there's less nutrition, my body is already sicker being born to start with than, than my great grandparents. And so by me eating healthy and my husband eating healthy, and then if we were to have children, then, then the child that was being born to us would be healthier. And so we've got to install, instill those practices as well for future generations. Yeah. And likewise, when you're working with farmers, there are, are sort of first steps that you can have farmers take towards greater soil health. I, I have another quote from one of your blogs, no-till and cover should be a requirement for every cost share program on crop ground. And we're not talking about a mandatory problem or program here. We're talking about when the, the, the farmer seeks government support, we can require basic soil health practices to go along with that government support. You wanna to speak to that, Eric? Oh, well, I, and I speak to two ways. You know, you talked about like the gradient. But when I speak to a lot of these landowners, it's amazing when I just let them know, like that quote about everything you do may become somebody's drinking water. And when they're in a watershed, you really see the aha moments. They don't, they're like, wow, I, I never thought about that. I never thought. And it's the same thing with cost share. And, and, and we can go, we can have another hour long conversation about government programs and cost share. But at the very least, I think we should, we should go a direction that we know is regenerative in, in regards to cost share, but we have to educate. And the problem is with a lot of cost share, people chase that dollar. I've done it in the past. We chase it and we're like, we, we want to get that money. So, so we just do that practice, but we don't know why we did it. We don't know the basics behind it. We don't know the soil health principles behind it. So I just plant cover crops because there's cost share on cover crops. But after the cost share is up, I don't do anything anymore. When people truly understand the principles of soil health, the principles of no-till, the principles of diversity, of a living root, and, and the five principles, and when they all tie together, when they get it, as I say, when the light bulb comes on, we don't need cost share anymore. They're going to do it on their own. And truly, that's what cost share should be, whether it be grazing systems or whether it be cover crops, is it is a boost to let them get over that transition period to then say, thank you very much, but we're where we need to be right now. But cost share, unfortunately, in, in a lot of places, is not like that anymore. It's just, it's, and it doesn't really pick the right target. You know, uh, when, when you build terraces, you just slow down water. You don't stop the problem. You know, when you build underground outlets, and I'm getting into probably terms that are different, but a lot of our cost shares are based off what's popular for the farmer at the time, not really what gives the most bang for the buck in regards to the soil health principles. So Eric, the problem that you work with in terms of protecting surface waters um, is often with the livestock manage management practices that farmers have these days. We've got the, the great big feedlots, and then you have the enormous lagoons of waste, and then that has to be empty, just like you know you have to empty sewage from a, a you know treatment plant or whatever. Mm -hmm. That has to go somewhere. It can't live in the lagoon forever. And what happens is primarily that waste is spread on farmland. And but the soils aren't healthy enough, so they're not absorbing all of that waste. And a lot of that waste is running off into the water. Um, so with that problem, you have the problem of antibiotics that are given to 
the the animals and that was also something that you mentioned in your blog i i won't go to the quote this time i'll just let you take the floor so both of you like why should we be concerned about antibiotics given to animals is that something that can impact our water health our environment and our human health you know so so we won't get into capos and feedlots and stuff like that and i'm not inherently against antibiotics or medications to animals but there's a big difference between treating, treating a sick animal or treating something as a preventative for a long time and that's what we do a lot in the livestock industry i've done i've done it myself in the past but both whether it be human pharmaceuticals or animal pharmaceuticals they're not taken out of drinking water so there's no treatment processes to take pharmaceuticals out and and again there's a lot of research on how much our body actually utilizes compared to how much we get rid of as waste and so you know in the ozarks where i live in missouri we've got pristine groundwater but there's instances of antibiotics uh hormones and stuff in in the groundwater because you know what whatever we take comes out you know so not just the livestock industry on that but the the human industry there, there is again if it goes back to nutrition why are we getting sick to begin with? You know, do, do we need antibiotics? Do we need some of these medications? Absolutely. But, but the instances of like the amount of drugs we use in the livestock industry, the amount we use in people, you know, one of the, one of the things in Missouri Rural Water, we do a prescription drug take back program is we want to keep it out of the drinking water. We don't want people flushing your drugs down the toilet. And one of the things I think the United States is 5% of the world's population. And I believe they take 80 to 85% of the world's drugs. And, and I think I'm throwing numbers out here, but the, the amount of people that was on two to three drugs is, is astronomical. Well, that's a whole other program for somebody else to solve. But the fact is that is getting into our drinking water because what, what, what comes out sooner or later becomes drinking water one place or another. So the same thing with, with the livestock industry, you know, um, yeah, so that's maybe gone off the path just a little bit, but no. it is a problem. Yeah, and Leanne, I'm sure you could tell us more about how this is impacting your patients. Uh, absolutely. So um, it's it's creating a, a, a very uh, big problem for us. Uh, of course, antibiotics kill bacteria, kill, and that is our gut. Um, and so uh, we're getting um, a lot of gut issues, a lot of leaky gut syndrome. Uh, a lot of autoimmune issues um, because of the fact of these animals are being inundated with a lot of uh, unnecessary antibiotics. Just it's a it's a, a course of action now that they just you've got a, a feedlot or animals or they're, they're going to get some antibiotics um, and then we consume those foods and, and we actually are, are getting the antibiotics in our body and then they're killing our gut flora um, and that's why we see an elevated rise in probiotic use. Um, but the problem is, is not every probiotic is created the same. And so there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different probiotics. And so in my clinic, when patients come in, I might have a sampling of 50 different probiotics to use, but there might be one probiotic that's right for that person because we are individual. We are not um, a cookie cutter recipe. Um, so you have to look at the, the patient individually and see what that patient needs um, to be rehabilitated and to, to feel better. And then also with regards to the hormones, that's why we're seeing uh, puberty happening in children at a younger and younger age. Um, along with, uh, un unfortunately, um, the uh, antidepressant medications um, are also going into our water supply. And for me, that is a, a very big problem. And, and I'll just speak a little bit when we kill uh, it's very simple. Uh, we can handle the depression, um, uh, uh, the level of uh, depression that we have in the country very easily. So uh, when we kill our, our gut flora, 90% uh, of the serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter, is created in our gut, 90%. 50% uh, of dopamine, which is another neurotransmitter, is created in our gut. 40% uh, of dopamine is created in our kidneys. It is not created in our brain. So giving a chemical drug to handle depression uh, by handling the brain with the neurotransmitters, all we have to do is go to healthy foods, organic foods, organic soils, um, and um, the reduction of antibiotic use, except when necessary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I totally agree with my husband. As always, you use everything when appropriate, um, in appropriate doses, and you carry it through to the end. Um, but then we could reestablish the gut flora 
and then we could reestablish the serotonin and dopamine production, which are neurotransmitters, and we could live healthier and happier. Yeah, it's so amazing how well it works. Um, you, your colleague at Understanding Ag, Sarah Kyo, she gave a, a webinar last week for Understanding Ag on the work that she does as a nutritionist. And I was so inspired by that. I realized like, wow, so if, if I just clean up my gut, maybe I wouldn't have seasonal allergies because it's pollen season near DC where I am. And you can just see the tassels of pollen and looking out the window, see them hanging and they're dropping on the driveway and the patio is everywhere. Um, but I was like, well, Sarah says that it's about having a healthy gut. So why don't I just look up anti-allergy, anti-inflammatory foods and see what I can do with that. And so this week I made a really crazy soup. <laughs> I made beet, uh, it's beef broth or chicken broth, beets, mushrooms, and then tons of herbs and spices and especially spicy things that are, are good for, for clearing allergies. And, and so like for the first spring of my life since I was in grade school, I'm not taking allergy medication. Wow at the moment. And I was just surprised how well it worked and how fast it worked. Like, I was like, well, today I have to do something. So I probably should take a third turn. Well, let me just see if I can do something else instead. And, and it worked. And so I'm, I'm a true believer for sure. Um, but it also works. So taking it back to the soil health aspect, um, tell us about your farm and how these principles are working in action where, where you all have control over how things are done. How, how good does it get? Well, it gets good. I say we need to do more all the time. We spend so much time on the road, but you know, the, uh, the, the rotation is the biggest thing what we always see, you know, it, 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 the ability when you're rotating animals, when you move animals, one thing to another, we really see differences. If we get too busy and we don't able to manage like we should, but moving cattle, moving sheep around certain areas, the farm suffers. So, I mean, we really see, I always joke, you learn from the bad experiences as much as you do the good experiences where they don't become bad anymore. You just take a look and say, okay, what can I do different? You know, anytime we have animal health problems, anytime we have pasture problems per se, anytime there's something out of whack, it's usually something we're not doing with keeping, keeping diversity, keeping rotations, keeping animals moved or not they're on the same area, same amount of the time. And man, we've been doing this so many different years where, where we've learned so much and it's it, it's so funny because like every time we read something else like oh we got to go try this we got to go try this well we don't have time to try this you know but but the bottom line is it really makes you see when you're doing things right and it really makes you see when you're not doing things right and it comes back to a simplicity of of diversity whether it be with people with grass with what we eat with with our soils everything rotation keeping animals moving at different parts of the time and, and things really come to life when you kind of kind of click it and kind of kind of get it together and follow like the soil health principles you know and so right now we're going through a little transition on the farm where we're trying to get things set up to to move better do better and it gets exciting because you really see the benefits and the profit goes up the, the quality of life goes up so it, it's not hard it's just a matter of being a discipline to do a lot of it and it's different than what what the norm is. Yeah, and you, you, sorry, I was gonna say you need a community of, of practitioners that you can be in conversation with and see what different people are doing. Um, I had the really great opportunity to interview Chris Nichols, Dr. Chris Nichols, yeah. who's another understanding ag expert. And she, she was there in North Dakota with this amazing group of farmers, including Gabe Brown, who just really wanted to see how far they could go it with soil health. And they were very scientific about it, maybe a little competitive, you know, it's like they, they wanted, they would hear about something and want to try it out on the farm and, and they would do side by side trials and spend years like seeing like what's actually working. I'm not just gonna switch the whole farm to something. I'm going to, to test it out. And um, they became some of the most amazing soil leaders in the country. I don't think it's an accident that, that it involved having a scientist like Chris Nichols there with them, an expert who could encourage them and move them along, but they also seem to have a really great community. And that's one of the wonderful things about understanding ag is you all have created a great community of experts and practitioners 
who can help one another move along in this journey. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to hear Gabe Brown and also his son, Paul, speak at the Kavira Conference mm -hmm. in, in the Southwest. That's a great conference. Um, and I have always been interested in this from the perspective of climate change. I started out as a young climate activist and I went vegetarian for the climate because I heard that the rainforests were being cut down for cattle grazing. And, and really I was a vegetarian for 30 years from wow. age 16 to age 46. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm letting myself eat meat because I realize that, you know, factory farms are certainly a problem, but, but obviously there are practitioners, farmers who are doing holistic plant grazing, who are having incredible climate results on their farms, just being able to sequester so much carbon. So that's always the, the lens that I looked at this through. And I was really geeking out about carbon and soil health. But when I heard Gabe and Paul Brown speak, what they were talking about is, is really how this works economically for a farm. So once you're using good soil health practices and you're managing animals, you can really increase your stocking density meaning you can put more like from this perspective of animals on the land being a problem you think of it oh you have too many cows and they're they're overgrazing and the land is getting worn out and and sadly that is the fact in the united states you know our all of our land should be sequestering carbon because that's what land does that's just like the natural role of land in the carbon cycle but our rangelands are sequestering minimal of amounts of carbon at this point. And in the next few years, if things continue like this, I think what we will see is we'll see a loss of carbon. We'll have negative <laughs> carbon sequestration on our rangelands. And that's just a horrifying thought. On the other hand, you can quickly reverse that trend. And certainly you've done it, Eric, on your farm. Gabe and Paul Brown have done it. And when you do that, then that land can just do so much more and produce so much more. And so after watching their talk, I realized it's like, gosh, what we should be talking about isn't carbon because most people don't really understand carbon or they don't care about carbon, but we should be talking about these are the most productive farms in the world. Per acre, they can be so productive. I love, they did a slide where they showed like how they, how many animals they could move over one piece of land. Because if you're using different types of animals, maybe I should let you take the floor now and tell me how this works, because you're the farmer. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny you talk about the, the carbon thing, you know, or the climate change, global warming, and I, I, whatever you want to spend it at the time, you know, but what you see, it's like many times I think the public is is taking the wrong direction on what is causing a lot of problems. So, so me personally, I see it, especially around the Midwest, is, is the water cycle, how we, you know, in our area, we'll get six, seven inch range, you know, and it all run off. It's, it seems like the water cycle is what's really broke both the, I think there's a, 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 a not a short term, long term, but like a local water cycle and a bigger water cycle in regards to storms. And, you know, I've heard some talks from some climatologists and we really are seeing weather patterns change in regards to that. I, I personally, this is Eric Fuse personally, that don't think it's emissions from power plants and emissions from cars. Well, there's a lot of things we can do with that. But when you look at the Paul and Gay Browns and look what can be done with soil, and that's inherently what those soils were like 120 years ago, 200 years ago, and you take that over a large area and it doesn't take much of a calculator to figure, well, there's where our carbon's from. There's And, and, and we have the ability in agriculture to immediately turn that back around. And I honestly think we can have the same lifestyles we have now. We can raise more food than we're raising now. We don't have to change what we raise. We don't have to change what we graze. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be a give and take in that regard. I think we can have all the same, but just do it in a regenerative way. And that's kind of what's frustrating. You know, when you, when you look at what's happening and, and you know that solutions aren't some big technological advance that's going to cost a trillion dollars kind of like we're sold it's like why don't we just plant a cover crop why don't we just rotate these cattle a little bit more why don't we just plant a little bit more diversity that's what's frustrating it's frustrating when i work on a local level from a water standpoint and say if i could just get half you farmers to do a little bit i could change the entire water quality of this of this watershed 
And so when it does come to when we talk about regulation, that's what gets frustrating because I'm like, what is it going to change to change this big of a group and the way we've done things forever? And I think that's where consumer input comes in a lot. You know, I, I, I love visiting with the landowners. I, I love trying to see what I can change myself to be a good example in our place. But I do think consumers have to get much more involved you know, I always talk about there's a big difference between clean water and clean drinking water. And people need to get educated. You know, I could have a, 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 some water that looks really clear and nice, but it'd be full of nitrates and atrazine and glyphosate. So I'd like to see people get more involved. And, and when we talk about regulation, climate change, what should we do for the future? I think it's a personal thing that, excuse me, we should change in that direction. We change it with our pocketbook. We change how we buy money. And we change what we expect. And because the solutions are there now, it's not some crazy big, like I said, technology, new equipment, new anything. It's changed right between the ears. And it's frustrating because we want to, we want to see a change and we see the potential. And again, I, I, I do have to give understanding that it's what's such a cool to be a part of. They're making that change. They're making it bigger than anything I've ever seen. And uh, so I probably got off the topic just a little bit there, but the solutions are at hand. And it doesn't take the government to do it. We can do it with us. We can do it with our pocketbook. And we can do it with things like we're doing right now. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. So this is not the end. But someone in the chat reminded me that, yes, speaking of expanding community, what's the best way to connect with Eric and Leanne? So let's do that now before I forget. And then we'll go back into our conversation. OK, so I'm glad to give my personal cell phone an email. Uh, my cell phone is 573. 429-1383. Uh, my email is efuchs9988 at gmail.com. I'll be glad to reach out on any water quality questions, any questions. I'm, I'm speaking for Leanne a little bit here, but probably best to reach out through me on any questions with her. But I uh, would love to reach out as many as you possibly can because we're, we're pretty passionate about this. And the more we can reach, the, the bigger change we can make. And also, I have uh, two Facebook pages. I have the Trossel Chiropractic LTD, and then I have an Apple Day Nutrition Center. Um, so those are avenues that people can reach out uh, to me as well, um, or Messenger. And uh, yeah, and I'd they, be happy to, to answer any questions or help in any way I can. And they can also reach out through Understanding Ag to get hold of me that way as well, either one of us. Great, so let's continue this good conversation. Leanne, I'd love to hear from you what your favorite success stories are from your practice. Oh my gosh. Um, so I have a little boy, um, their entire family, um, uh, both sisters, all of their children, the mom, the grandma, um, all come to me. Uh, they came to one of my, I give nutritional talks um, and uh, they came to one of the talks because uh, they had heard about me and their son became autistic after his 18 month um, vaccinations um, and uh, they said can you help and I said I'd be more than willing to, to give it a try um, and so I, I evaluated the child found heavy metals uh, and parasites in his brain and started uh, handling the case naturally with some homeopathic remedies and some organic um, vitamins and minerals and uh, saw a substantial increase and in rise in his ability to socially interact with others. He was able to walk down uh, the stairs into the church basement. And he was, he was 11 at the time when I first started. Um, he had never been able to do that before. He was able to go see his very first movie um, at a movie theater. Had never been able to do that before. Uh, went um, on an outing with his family, rode his first camel, uh, went zip lining, uh, did a high ropes course. Um, and it's just I had a better quality of life and his um, they, they always compliment me and I'm, I'm so exceptionally flattered and my associate Shelly Moma uh, is right right in there with me batting and helping um, these people uh, and these families and such on an individual and also a group basis but um, his ability his um, acuity his his intelligence is just soared and, and that would be uh, just one of the hundreds and hundreds of success stories that we have in our clinic Wow, that's just amazing. That, yeah. yeah, thank you so much for what you do, Dr. Fuchs. It's just so amazing. How about you, Eric? What's your favorite success story? We talked about your own farm, which sounds pretty amazing, but what, what have you seen that you're excited about 
in the farms that you work with in Missouri when you're thinking about water quality? You know, I get more excited when you see the community come together. When you see, you know, you have, we, we we're doing a bunch of landowner meetings up in Northwest Missouri on a watershed up there. And due to COVID, we have to keep the, the groups pretty small, but we, uh, with the help of uh, Luke Skinner, a friend of mine from NRCS, we do the rainfall simulators, nitrate, uh, slake test, a whole bunch of different stuff that you've probably seen at Ray's. And when you see the aha moment of these guys, and when you see these guys that have been farming for years, like, oh, wow. And when you see a, a, a farmer that's 60, 65 years old, and I get a text, and he's like, when should I put on my fertilizer? I didn't know that. And, and I'm, I'm flattered because it's like, wow, it's aha. And it, it makes me, we always joke, then it makes me do better, too. I'm like, golly, we need to go do better on our place. You know, we're not doing what we should do at our place. And it's that. It's that ability, because we love this. I mean, I'm one of those weird guys that I don't know whether I'm working or I don't know whether I'm playing because we love these landowner meetings. We love it because you feel like you're truly making a change. And uh, what we're doing is right. What we're doing is the right thing for the consumer, you know, for the people, for the long-term survival of things, you know. And so we're pretty passionate about it. But when you get around that and you see the aha moments, as people call it, of a, of a rainfall simulator, it's worth it worth it. That's very cool. Well, we have a very good question on the Facebook chat. Um, the question is, how about helping the people on this live stream learn how to get cleaner water at home? So how do we know if you just mentioned that it can look clear, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you don't know what's in it? How, how do you know to start out with whether you have clean water at home? Well, the first thing I would say, if you buy water from any entity, each each uh, town or each water district has to put out what's called a consumer confidence report each year and uh it, it has got a list of things that they test for each year or, or and so that can go to like your water district website it'll come out with your bill each year so that'll give you an idea um if people are concerned about their water and from uh, you know a lot of people talk about reverse osmosis and, and dist distillation type system we got a good old carbon filter and I think it's as good as anything. So that's number one for your own personal. But I would also say get a little more educated, get a little bit more involved. Uh, you know, not from a crazy standpoint, because I have to say that the, the water operators are doing the best they know how to do. We are fortunate, but get more involved in, in understanding of what's in the water and, and what area you're in and why it's happening like that. And, and please reach out to me, you know, but from a good old standpoint of just keeping your water clean, I've been watching a few questions here about fluoride and stuff like that. A lot of water systems aren't using fluoride anymore. It's kind of the thing in the past, seems like it's going away. But uh, carbon takes out a lot of that stuff. You know, carbon takes out chlorine. If you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times you can set water out and let it sit for a while and the chlorine will dissipate off depending on whether it's chlorine or chloramine. So different things you can do like that. But I uh, usually keep it simple. Keep, the, keep a good old carbon Brita filter. Does probably as good as anything. Anything to add to that, Dr. Schutz? Um, no, I think you covered it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And how about bottled water? Should should we be drinking bottled water? Um, uh, if we are drinking bottled water, what's the best kind? You know, we put a we've got a little advertisement we put out with Missouri Rural Water with I think a twelve ounce thing of water that says this can be filled six hundred times for the price of the bottle for what most people pay for drinking water, you know? So most bottled water, I guess you can buy all your fancy, but most time it's gonna be out of some municipal water tap. If you look on it, it says it came from Texas or wherever out of the water tap. So for the most part, quality wise, it's probably not gonna be a whole lot different. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure there's people out there that have a lot more information on me, but I, I take a great big old jug with me and fill it out of my, either my tap or out of our a faucet you know with the filter and that's what i take with me so i could i could add to that um i, I believe the company is called spring mountain um it comes in um, green glass uh bottles and it is probably the number one uh bottled water that i would recommend and the second would be avion uh water those are the two top waters that i would recommend if a person wanted to continue drinking bottled water uh, they are excellent sources so, yeah. Probably say the biggest problem is people don't drink enough water, <laughs> right? There you go, Dr. Fuchs, how much water should we be drinking? Um, you know, uh, rule of thumb is uh, half of your body weight in ounces. Um, yeah, it's a lot. 
Um, <laughs> so, um, but that's that's a general rule of thumb. And if you're already thirsty, uh, you're already dehydrated. So um, I uh, try to just uh, drink uh, regularly throughout the day um, and just keep my body uh, nurtured and saturated. And also, if your urine is like very concentrated and yellow, then you're dehydrated. You just need to drink more. It should be a very light color um, or very just uh, very faint in color at all. And that's when you know you're drinking probably enough fluids. Yes. Okay, well, we've got five minutes left and I'm going to monopolize the rest of the discussion with my favorite question right now, which is if we want to reward or pay or compensate farmers for their soil health practices and all the environmental benefits thereof, so we've got climate benefits, water benefits, et cetera, what's the best way to do that? Well, first of all, I probably have to say if I had my, my choice, I would get rid of all payments whatsoever and make incentives based off uh, quality of what they produce, you know, nutrient dense. You know, we, we, we are not as farmers, we are paid per pound or per bushel. We are not paid on what the protein content is or what the fat content is or different things. You know, I, in the beef industry, a little bit more with grading and stuff, but, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments are my world. And sediments, is where most of the chemicals and stuff. So, you know, we, we, we say we're all about soil erosion, and but the fact is my, my world's getting worse. It's not getting any better. We're spending more money through ag programs forever, but we always never tackle the true source of the problem. And the true source of the problem is soil health. You know, so, you know, we build, we build uh, uh, terraces, we build things to slow water down. So, it has to be somehow based off a of true soil health, diversity, cover crops, no-till, living root all year long, you know. And, and I just tell people, drive around during the off season about anywhere and look and see what's growing in egg fields. There's nothing growing. It's nothing growing. So we have to, you know, and, and with all that comes carbon. So it's not a very straightforward answer there, but it's it, everything that is regenerative. And there is a big difference between sustainability and regenerative. And we know what regenerative things are. It, it is no secret what does regenerative things. So it has to be something based off that because I am all for individual park property rights. I'm all for landowners and what they do there. But what they do there does affect a lot of others as well, especially when it comes to water quality. So all payments should be based off regenerative type practices, practices that stop nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and pollutant our water, better quality food, and carbon, and something, like I said, that's going to be, and it has to be on an education standpoint. Every farm program should based off, when we did a grazing system on the farm 25 years ago, we had to go to school. We had to go to a two-day to school to learn the basics of why we were doing this and why it worked. That's what we have to do with any cost share when it comes to to anything out there. We have to teach the why, because if they don't know the why, there's no reason for them to continue doing it from, from then on out, because it doesn't mean anything to them. Long answer to a short question, maybe? No, that's that's a great start. And I want to ask you a follow-up. Um, secretary Vilsack, the USDA secretary, he has suggested that we create a carbon bank and the USDA would spend money out of the Commodity Credit Corporation, which is about $30 billion that the USDA can spend discretionarily each year. They would take that money, buy carbon credits. I think they were talking about $20 a ton, which doesn't sound like a lot to me. And, um, and then eventually, if we had a cap and trade program, polluters would be able to buy carbon credits from the USDA instead of reducing their pollution, You know, talking about fossil fuel uh -huh. polluters. Um, any thoughts on that proposal? Usually all those trading and all that, cat, you know, we're seeing it with nutrient trading and stuff. It's just a kick the can down the road. You know, give us the money to go train all these guys, truly train them for what they need to be doing. And I'm not saying I'm inherently against those, but it just gets confusing and how we do it and who's going to measure and who's got their finger in the pot and everything else. It just confuses things. We know what we need to do to fix the problems. It's just whether we're big enough or willing or willing to tackle it or the right people to, to be in the right places to get it done. So that stuff all sounds nice. 
I'm just not a big fan of it, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I agree as it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was great when Gabe Brown showed up in Congress and he testified and you know, they all want to know, like, what should we be doing to pay farmers? He's like, uh, I don't believe in government support. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it, it is, we, we've been on both sides of that thing and still are, you know, and, and it's something we strive to do. I am not completely against certain things, but what happens, it never, just like regulations, it starts out right, but it never gets to the point it really needs to be. It gets skewed, it goes the wrong direction, and unfortunately, when government gets involved, Mm -hmm. Lots of times it doesn't seem to go the direction it needs to be. We just need to get to the basic understanding, and we have it. We have it right now. Yeah. Well, I personally am a big fan of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned over and over that we need education and training so that people know what's up. You know, they get out of ag school or they learn from whoever owned the farm before them how to do things, and that doesn't always keep up with the latest on, on soil health. and. So we've got to make these resources available available to people. And then there, I think the conservation stewardship program and the conservation reserve program, especially now that the conservation reserve program lets people plant native grasses, graze cattle, plant trees. Those are really good programs. And so that's personally, if the USDA has $30 billion to spend, <laughs> which, may, which probably they don't, but if they did have $30 billion to spend on soil health, I would say, Put it in that direction. I, you know, like I joke, if there's, if I get to pick the people who manage the programs, I'd be all for it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I always say in my farmer meetings, if I was king for a day, here's what I would do. And you know, th those certain people that have the certain goals in mind, and uh, we get to the right direction. But you know, we're making. I say we, you know, uh, understanding act. Those guys. I've been around enough to, to see the next best and the next greatest program and the next thing that's going to solve everything. I have to say I've never been a part of something that I truly think is the basic solution, both whether it be with what Leanne's doing, how it all ties to the soil. We have the tools. It, this is a win-win situation. It, there's no lose in this for the most part. You know, maybe some, some, some people that lose, you know, but for the most part, this is a win-win all the way across the board. And you don't see that very often. And that's what makes it exciting. It makes it know that you have a purpose that's right and, and you want to run with it. Great. Well, let's close by having Dr. Seeds tell us what you're inspired by, what you think. It was because that was a nice message of hope, Eric, I have to say. <laughs> and so, Dr. Seeds, what is your message of hope that we can get this right, that we can achieve these things in soil health and human health? Oh, without a doubt. I, I think we're doing it right now. I see a, a great movement um sweeping uh, across the country sweep, sweeping across the globe people want change and and my husband nailed it with regards to it has to start with the consumer mm -hmm. and the more live talks that we do and thank you for inviting us again mm -hmm. um getting the word out there are so many like-minded people that want to know what to do i see it with my patients day in and day out you know we start communicating i get more people that are like yeah and they have similar viewpoints, wants and desires. And so then we just start brainstorming and I'm like, okay, well, this is what my husband does. And then I talk about understanding ag. And so I don't think it's an insurmountable problem anymore. I said, I think that if we all unite with a strong front of what is needed and wanted, um, we can have that future. And it doesn't have to be, you know, the next generation, it can be in our generation, it can be in this lifetime. And so I think that's what my husband and I, that is our primary purpose in life and living this, is to drive that forward. And we're getting more and more people that seem to uh, want to go in the same direction we are. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, both of you, Eric Fuchs, Dr. Leanne Fuchs. Thank you so much for taking this time with us. I know you both are very busy. And I, I'm very grateful also to everyone who joined us live today. Please share this video, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Alexis. Bye. Appreciate Bye. it. Thank you so much. Thank you.